where things are a little different and there's none of these bad boys. It's actually light years away from the north side. You ready? Let's go. Whoa. Whoa, that was quick. Well, at least I had a chance to change, though. I could say it's been a rough day. Wow. See, I got nothing. You got all of them. Any more? Bad jokes, no. I'm ready to go here. <laughs> Chicago is the center of the sports universe, but there is other life out there. I think I'm on that planet right now, as a matter of fact. Uh -huh. There was a very heightened check of everything as all the camera bags were opened up and everybody's laptop computer was opened up. And I think that really brought it into focus for me. We talked to uh, Jocelyn Tebow after the win over the Flyers the other night. He said he can feel it start to come back a little bit. A couple of times we heard the fans chant Tebow, Tebow after a couple of great saves. <laughs> Okay, we're halfway through editing our story, and the regular season hits the halfway point here at Hallis Hall. At 6-2, and two, the question now is, is the glass half full or half empty? The situation is this. The Illini have a third down and seven from the 23-yard line. Kirk Kittner drops back the pass and flips the ball to Rocky Harvey. <laughs> Things kick off tomorrow night at Soldier Field. Hopefully, Zach Thornton will be really in tune, just like I was on that one. Boy, that really hurt. <laughs> Five months of hard work here at the Oven Practice Facility have really paid off for the Illini. Lots of expectations and lots of expectations met. First, there's the Big Ten Co-Championship, and that led to the number one seed in the NCAA Tournament with a game coming up on Friday. They expect to win here. It's written on the wall, as you can see. They talk about the Big Ten Championship getting to the Final Four. They were there the last time in 1989. A number not up there under the NCAA National Champions. They wanted to say 2001. They want to go to Minneapolis. I think I know the problem here. I'm going to talk to Terry for a second. Terry, I think I know the problem. This won't kick over here. I'm thinking you have the wrong thing in the car here. I think you need a starter rather than a reliever. What do you think? <laughs> Not a bad seat in the house here at Miller Park. A lot of great sight lines and a lot of great ticket prices. You can get a ticket here at Miller Park for just $1. They're called the Bob Euchre seats. They're not bad seats at all, as long as you're not a, afraid of heights. Come on, Hump, that was a ball. One of the strengths of this defense has been the secondary. They've been especially good in one area. Passes defended, knocking down the ball. It's Newcomer's Day at Wrigley Field. The Cubs trying to take a fight out of the cards. The winning highlights headed your way. Ouch. It's the Red Sox pass. Hope to Hump, the White Sox in Fenway Park. Tonight playing the part of pitcher present. It is Brett Saberhagen. Speeding is allowed in Cicero this weekend. Yes, it is. Plus, we'll tell you about a Bears retirement party in Platteville. Welcome to the show, Chicago. I'm Jeff Fisher. For those people worried about team chemistry, forget about it. The 2001 version of the Cubs is a virtual melting pot of talent who have all come from all over the place. Don't believe me? Take a look at who helped the Cubs bounce back against the cards this afternoon at Wrigley. We start with Delino DeShield. Remember him last year in an Orioles uniform? Yeah, that was Delino right there. Let's go to the present day. He was the O's player of the year last year. And he's the player of the day today as he gets the Cubs tied at one with a home run into a 14-mile-an-hour win, blowing in his first as a Cub. Now, bottom of the fourth at 3-1, Ron Coomer. He was a twin last year. Yep. Looking good in the cubby blue right here. The double to right field, Michael Tucker. We'll talk about where he was earlier this year. Scores, cards on top by a score of 3-2. Still in the bottom of the fourth, another new face this year. He was in Seattle last year. Robert Machado, out. Look out, Daryl Kyle. Thought it got him in the face. It actually got him in the chest. Uh, that hurts. He stays in a little back. Team will help that. Can we please get a clean up in aisle nine? Oh, my. Matt Stairs, we're in the Athletics Uni last year. This year, we're in the Cubs Uni. The single to shallow left in the sixth inning. Now, three batters later. Coomer, we've already told you where he was last year. Coming through in the clutch here, thanks to a little misplay by Ray Langford. Can't come up with a liner, and we're tied at three as Stairs scores. Bottom of the eighth. Flashback time. That's Michael Tucker in Red Red. Also played for the Royals, also played for the Braves. Check out the guy in the bleachers. Ouch. Oh, a knockout punch for the Cubs right there. How about it? Tucker puts him on top, 4-3. Gordon, two years ago, a Red Sox. Mark McGuire at the plate. In the here and now, one out. Blows him away. Two Ks in the ninth. And the Cubbies win by a score of 4-3. And who is the girl who loved Tom Gordon? I do not know. Good book. It was, but yeah. I don't know the answer. I don't Never know read. it either. The formula for the Cubbies today, the same. We should make that our trivia question. Who's the girl that loved Tom Gordon? You'll be in charge of that. Okay. The formula today, the same as it so often is. Good starting pitching, clutch hitting, and the F-Troop. Farnsworth, Becerra, and Flash combined for three hitless innings to close this one out.
Yeah, that was really nice. Take a look at the up to minute at standings. Cubs get a little help as Pittsburgh downs Houston 3 2 tonight, so the lead is four. Cards eight and a half back, and then Milwaukee, Pittsburgh, and Cincinnati rounding things out. Tomorrow, the Cubs will turn to one Kerry Wood. He of the 165 strikeouts. Andy Bennis takes the hill for the Cardinals. He's given up seven runs in 10 innings against the Northsiders this season. Well, we are far from done with a Fred McGriff story. Later in the show, reaction from the Cubs and their fans on finally reeling in the crime dog. With Warwick Holdman suffering from a knee injury, the Bears were expecting Sean Harris to start at linebacker alongside Brian Erlacher. Today we found out that Sean Harris apparently has other ideas. Harris today stunned his teammates and coaches by retiring from football. The six-year veteran says his body just wasn't reacting to the way he had hoped, and he decided to hang it up at the ripe old age of 29. Touchdown, Chicago! Uh, I like him. I know that everybody in the team is going to be performing 101%. And he needs 101% to do that. How do you do 101? I don't know. I mean, I, I think it only goes up to 100, doesn't it? People say 110. I've never heard of 101. 100. Ever. Uh, but that's Cristiano D'Amata, yeah. and he won last year's Kart Indy Car Race at the Chicago Motor Speedway with 101%. The man that <laughs> finished second last year, Michael Andretti. Michael, like his father Mario, a bona fide star who's the winningest active driver in kart. After this morning's session of practice, I talked with him about his drive to win at the age of 38. <laughs> Andretti spent most of the day shaking down the car and trying to find some speed, but he says he does like the challenges of Chicago Motor Speedway. It's a good track, uh, nice one mile oval, you know, you have long straights, tight corners, and, uh, you know, hopefully some good passing, you know, and that's, that's what it's all about for the fans, so it's, uh, I think it's a nice place. He enters Sunday's race in fourth place in the season point standings, but he feels the second half of the season will be very good now that his new team has hit its stride after a win in Toronto. For all of you, down in front, uh, prepare to get wet or prepare to clear up. Is it still as fun as it was way back when in 91 when you won the championship? I don't know if it's as much fun because it's way more hard work. Uh, it, the results don't come as easy and and so it, it's not quite as fun as it used to be because of that. Michael won the overall championship in 91 and 10 years later would be the perfect amount of time to win his second championship since he's finished second five times and doesn't like the label of being a bridesmaid. It would be unbelievable, you know, because how competitive it is and being with the new team like we are here with the team Motorola it would just be a, a real dream. Michael spent most of the day working on the race setup and that was a very slow day for him finishing 26 fastest in the afternoon practice session. Bruno Jankara was the fastest in practice qualifying for Sunday's race set for 1.30 tomorrow. Since he's coming here Jeff do you have any dog references you'd like to throw out there? I'm gonna go fetch me some tickets for Sunday's game. I'm going tomorrow. But I didn't have to fetch him. Somebody's given him. Cost you a couple of bones to get in, probably. Wow. You are on fire. You've had a long day today, haven't yes, you? Yes, I have. Yes. I need some sleep. Yes. You could say it's been a rough day. Wow. See, I got nothing. You got all of them. Any more? Bad jokes, no. I'm ready to go here. <laughs> Chicago is the center of the sports universe, but there is other life out there. I think I'm on that planet right now, as a matter of fact. Uh-huh. And for that reason, the National Sports Report will follow us at the bottom of the hour for a preview. Let's join Kevin Frazier in L.A. Now time for tonight's trivia answer. The question, how many Cy Young Awards does the current Red Sox roster have? The answer, six, and I can prove it. Pedro Martinez with three, Brett Saberhagen with two, David Cohn with one, and our winner is no one. We did not have one. We had a guy calling up saying it's got to be two, it's got to be we two. We proved it. There's six. It's six. Big win in the Arena Football League tonight for the Chicago Rush. First round of the playoffs, knock off the defending champs, Orlando. Neither guy says this is really a big deal. Now they're playing it down, and the quote from Brian earlier was, it just feels like the one zillionth time we've squared off, whether it's hockey or football or anything competitive that they do. As a matter of fact, probably the biggest difference the two say is the fact that when they played and they played each other, they would never talk to each other, at least now as coaches, they do speak to each other. They said they even took it when they played on the ice together that they wouldn't even go and talk to the other's wife or the other's kids. So they really ignored each other, but they look forward to this. Now, as far as the best start for the Hawks in 10 games, the last time it was this good was back in the 94-95 season. Darrell was the coach of the Hawks at that time. Now, as far as the head-to-head -head meeting, well, Darrell leads that. Nine wins to six wins, and there have been three ties. 
you always try to be better than each other. And both have been very successful behind the benches. Brian is fourth among active coaches with wins with 365. Darrell, as a player and a coach, has never missed the postseason. Tony Amante, the Blackhawk star, has played for both. He said both are very intense guys, both proven winners. He says the difference is Darrell's more apt to get into your face. Now, of course, the Hawks off to one of their best starts and a great start here at the UC, a place where they haven't been able to win lately, but this year they are undefeated at home coming in here. 3-0-1. One of the reasons, they're getting it done in front of the net. Against Calgary in the 6-3 win the other night, four of the goals came from within the crease, and Brian Sutter says that is winning hockey. The coach tells me to do go up and down that wing. One thing they do have to work on, the power play at this point in the season, just 5 for 43. We know the power play was a problem last year. We're going to come back a little bit later in the show and talk about the San Jose Sharks. Darrell has them playing well. They're at the end of a six-game road trip, and right now they lead the Pacific Division. Live at the United Center, I'm Jeff Fisher. Let's go back to Eric in the studio. Big Mac. He brought his big bat back to Wrigley today. But, hey, Slam and Sammy had his swat stick, too. Mags had a big day as well. His wallet got a little fatter while his lumber labored on the big wall of Fenway Park. And the boys at Cart strutted their stuff at today's Target Grand Prix, qualifying in Cicero. The CSR revs its motors now. Jim Tressel is ready to start camp in Columbus, and they're a feud and a fuss in a team. Ray Hall <laughs> talking racing there. The Jim Tressel era on the field officially underway in Columbus today. Buckeye freshman reporting to camp and beginning to learn what the first-year head coach expects from them. Tressel will have three days to get them ready for big-time college football because on Thursday, the upperclassmen report. But for now, it's all about the freshmen, and it's tonight's Fox Focus with Andy Baskin. Right, the crash took Pappas out of the race and doomed Breck to a 20th place finish. Team owner Bobby Rahal termed it stupid, just stupid. Hey, program scorecard here. Hey, program scorecard. All right. Hey, program scorecard Get here. to the ballpark. First thing you got to do, hey, got to buy the program. That's right. Program scorecard. You actually know how to score? You enjoy the game. You know how to sell this? I know how to sell it. You know how to sell it. Do you know how to score it? Uh, I haven't scored it since, uh, since I was a kid. Program scorecard. So now you're buying a program. Do you know how to score that? Yes, I do. Now, will you actually fact, score when you get inside? I probably will. Why do you do that? Of course, that's up to my girlfriend, right? Yeah. Are you going to let him score? <laughs> Oh, I got the joke. Yeah. Oh. It's quick, isn't he? Program scorecard. Wood trying to end this long top of the first. Does. Inning over. Kerry Wood strikes out the side. Now, here's the real question. You know what K stands for? Because strikeout doesn't start with K. You want to know? Oh, yeah, I want to know. Do you know? Here it comes. <laughs> well, wait a second. We're talking about a whole other line of scoring here. Program scorecard. Okay, the guy that invented scoring said the letter K was the most prominent letter in the word strikeout. Okay. So that's why it's K. Oh, very interesting. Yeah. She's not interested at all, actually. No, actually, I You can, I like, wow people with that. Seriously? Like when you're sitting no, at the... No, that's good. Are you sitting at the Sox game next time? That's good. Somebody puts a K down, you go, I know what that means. It's funnier than what I said, though. Program scorecard. So here's the real question. You play this game, but a lot of people don't know how to score it. I want to know, do you know how to score a baseball game? For the most part, I do. I think... Uh, after being around it my whole life, you should have a little bit of an idea. Program scorecard. Looks like he hit a double. That's 2B. I don't know about the writing, but it looks like he hit a double <laughs> there. 6-3, ground out. Program scorecard. Now, do you know what you did in this game here according to the way I scored it? Do you, do you know how to read a scorecard? See, I grounded out to short. Okay. Uh, unfortunately, I struck out twice, you and I it? popped out to third. Program scorecard. Now, this is a scorecard. Yes. What you have there is what? My personal scorecard. Program scorecard. A double play. Grounds it to the shortstop, flips it to second, and goes to first. How's that scored? 6-4-3. DP. DP? Is that important? You need the DP there? What? You need the DP? Not really. Not really, but you do? Yes. <laughs> there you have it. Double play. DP. Program scorecard. Broken bat flare. Left field base hit. Ricky around third. Here comes the throw. I think it went... And I may have missed a couple plays in between. It Give it a shot. There's a, there's a prize here for this. Seven. Two. And now the Cubs have runners all over the place. Fasano throws to second. Five. Girardi in a run down between first and second. One. <laughs> One somewhere in there, and then it went back to two. Close enough. How's that? That's that's good. Great answer. <laughs> and you won. That's the main thing. Save! 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 Cubs win! Cubs win! Here we are back at what many Illini fans call the scene of the crime. About a year ago, 
31-28, Illinois on top of Michigan with about four minutes to play. The situation is this. The Illini have a third down and seven from the 23-yard line. Kirk Kittner drops back the pass and flips the ball to Rocky Harvey. recovered his own fumble. It was Victor Hobson who just turned him 360 degrees. The play was ruled a fumble, even though a couple of days later, Big Ten officials said the referees made the wrong call on that. But to make matters worse, three plays later, the guys in the stripes jumped up and did it to the Illini again. Let me explain. You know what? There's no way to explain it. Take a look at what happened. Yes, it appears that Anthony Thomas's run ends with a fumble, but unlike the last play, this time there was no fumble called. Michigan goes on and scores and ends up winning. What do you remember about last year, one year after the fact? A fumble. That wasn't. Yeah. That wasn't a fumble. You know that. We haven't gave it a name yet. You know how they got like the immaculate reception and all that <laughs> stuff. We haven't gave it a name yet, but it's just the call right now. So. We're a different team than, than we were a year ago. They're a different team. Uh, it's different circumstances. we got different officials, so everything. <laughs> <laughs> that's every, a good thing. That's, yeah, I hope so. Actually, the players have named last year's fumbles. Just call them motivation as they go to the big house. In Champaign, I'm Jeff Fisher for the Chicago Sports Report. Time to get wet and wild as the cats prove they love water, especially while trying to hunt down a gopher with their shotgun attack offense. And mom, get out the tide. Prospect and Buffalo Grove battling each other in Mother Nature. Where's the valet when you need one? The young bulls pacing themselves after winning game one tonight. The baby bulls try to put the pedal to the metal in Indy. And the bears hungry for their third straight win. Mmm, some cooked cardinal cuisine would hit the spot. Simmer down, things are ready to heat up on the Chicago Sports Report. Welcome to the show, everyone. Alongside Paul Calvisi, I'm Jeff Fisher. Coming up, we'll fire up the highlight machine for game two of the MLS playoff game between the Fire and the Galaxy. Northwestern wide receiver Sam Simmons remembers it like it was yesterday, even though it was October 28th of last season. The Wildcats in Minnesota tied at 35, staring at overtime with just one play left in regulation. That's when the Cats went deep into the playbook for the play called Victory Right, a.k.a. the Hail Mary pass. It was Simmons that caught the prayer from quarterback Zach Kustak and gave NU the win by scoring the final 27 points of the game. Let's head to a very messy Ryan Field in Evanston where Simmons was up to his old tricks again against the Gophers, even playing his third game with a broken finger. Here we go. Damian Anderson, touchdown scamper here to put the Cats on top, 7-0. Anderson, 22 carries, 86 yards. Zach Kustak spreading the field. Four wide receivers. He will find Simmons, the man again today. 29 yards, nearly untouched. Great cutback. 13-3 Northwestern after the PAT was missed. Minnesota capping a drive right here to get within three. 13-10. Not a good day for David Wozlewski, the hero against Michigan State. Oops, yep, a little slippery. Missed the PAT, misses that field goal attempt. Much better day, though, for Simmons. Yeah, the broken finger, no problems here. Catching the punt, he will get it at the 29, and check it out here. Breaking several tackles, getting several good blocks, including one coming up by Roger Jordan. Watch it right there on the screen. Good block, touchdown run, 20-10, Cats on top. Fourth quarter now, Minnesota getting closer. Travis Cole in there. He's a baseball pitcher. He pitches this one to Ron Johnson. 40 yards on the score, 23-17. But the onside kick is recovered by Cunley Patrick. He was the man that actually tipped the ball last year that resulted in Simmons making the catch. Your final score, 23-17. And if you look at the stats on this one, Northwestern 4-1, and 2-1 one, and one in the Big Ten. Anderson's touchdown, 36th of his career, which is a new school record. For more on this one, let's join John Morales at the Purple Scene. South Bend we go. Irish fighting for their second straight win, taking on West Virginia early on. Julius Jones getting to the end zone. Dive in there, big fella. 19-yard touchdown run. Notre Dame up 7-0. Next possession, West Virginia. Big game for Avon Colburn. Taking off, 60 yards here, 26 carries, 169 at the end, gets through the tackle of Ron Israel. We are tied at seven. Coach Davey saying, I don't want to get fired, and I'm awfully mad. I'm fired up. Here come the comebacks from the West Virginia Mountaineers. Touchdown pass to A.J. Nastasi. We're tied at 17. Mountaineers make the comeback complete in the third. Brad Lewis to Torrey Johnson. Look at him thread the needle. West Virginia on top, 24-17. 
West Virginia 25 is where Tony Fisher takes over. 25-yard touchdown run, 22 carries, 119, game tied at 24. And then look at the play by Tony Fisher here. Thought they had him stopped at the line of scrimmage. 55-yard touchdown run, and the Irish get the win, 34-24. Who needs MJ? Michael Jordan, comeback road show in Miami tonight. Jordan expecting to play 21 minutes. Played 17 the other night, eight points against the Pistons. And what a start in this one. Look at that, in the lane, a little turnaround. That's vintage right there. Now a little post up here on Ricky Davis. Oh yeah, sinking the J. Seven for 10 from the floor, more Michael. Let's check out the pump fake right here. Oh my, no rust on that one. And then a little drive and hitting the runner. He had 18 points, and the Wizards win 99-79. Ohio State KO'd Northwestern last week. Today, Wisconsin, the lucky ones in the horseshoe. Lydell Ross, look at a move here. One play later, he will score 17-0 at that point, Ohio State. But here comes Wisconsin. Rick Bollinger, Bollinger to Nick Davis on the slant. That made it 17-14 OSU. A couple of field goals by the Badgers, and they get the upset and win it 20 to 17. We've all been there, sitting on the couch or the bar stool, of course, having soda. Our favorite football team has the W all wrapped up. Then the announcers mention that your team is playing a prevent defense, and you start screaming at the TV as the opposing quarterback starts to move the ball downfield. So why do coaches go to a prevent? Tonight, we try to explain the bend but don't break theory in our Fox Focus. High school football in the mid-suburban East title on the line on Beaton's Buffalo Grove and prospect colliding. Prospect goes on top 6-0. That's Jason Rodriguez. Prospect ranked number 12, Buffalo Grove number 20. Controversial play. 6-0 in the fourth quarter. And folks, Tom Zipkowski, the quarterback for Buffalo Grove, is ruled down. Saying the knee hit, it never hit. Watched it about 20 times. He is not happy. He will toss the football. He will be tossed, a.k.a. ejected. Sits alone on the bench. Afterwards, Buffalo Grove fans. With that sinking feeling, Prospect mm. wins 6 nothing. Wow. Play of the day, nine seconds to go. Akron and Miami of Ohio. Ben Roethlisberger with the hail of Hail Mary's right here. Heaving it downfield. The ball is tipped. Eddie Tillett's. Oh, oh my. Touchdown. Miami of Ohio will win it 30-27. One more look. Mary was listening. Touchdown. Red Hawks. Well, I understand, Jeff, it's going to be a very fast-paced show. Of course it's going to be. What with the champ IndyCars in town. We're going to try and qualify for the poll tonight. Let's quickly get to the big story today. It is finally true. Yes, Fred McGriff is a Cub, or at least he will be on Sunday. Today, McGriff finally agreed to a trade that will bring his potent bat to the middle of the Cubs lineup. Adding that pop that GM Andy McPhail has been searching for this year for the lowly Devil Rays. McGriff has been the only ray of hope, hitting 318, 19 homers, 61 ribbies. He's expected to be in the middle of the Cubs lineup on Sunday. Well, let's see if the McGriff news energized the Cubs against the Cards this afternoon at the friendly confines. The announcement in the third inning on the scoreboard and a mild round of applause. Top of the first. 14 mile an hour wind blowing in, but Lacido Polanco turns it around, a solo shot to left. Cards on top by a score of 1 0. Of course, they won the opener of this series. Bottom of the first, Delino to Shields going the opposite way, right into that same jet stream, or cutting into the jet stream. First home run as a Cub. We are tied at 1. Top of the second, the long ball, the popular choice of scoring runs today. Jim Edmonds, number 14 on the year, straightaway center field, and the Cards lead it by a score of 2-1. We go to the bottom of the fourth, it's 3-1 Cards, two outs. Ron Coomer gets all of this one into the corner. Michael Tucker can fly, he scores, and the Cards lead is cut to 3-2. Keep it in the fourth inning, and check out... Daryl Kyle, the pitcher, catches this one. It looked like his face at first, but it was his chest. He was okay. Gets the out, stays in the ball game. Bottom of the sixth, three, two with two outs. And Ron Coomer will come through in the clutch right here. Ray Lankford misplays the ball. Matt Stairs will score, and we are tied at three. Bottom of the eighth, game still tied at triples. Michael Tucker, his first home run as a Cub. It's a game winner. Watch the guy get crushed in the outfield off his head. And the Cubs win this one this afternoon by a score of 4-3. So the Cubs win another one-run game. They are now 20-10 of those games. Jason Bure goes 5-2 thirds, giving up all four hits. 
four relievers combined on a no-hitter after that. Jeff Becerro pitching a scoreless eighth. Tom Gordon finishing the ninth, picking up his 20th save and 23 chances. Now time for some news from Bears training camp, and there was a surprise in Platteville as a longtime Bears linebacker calls it quits. We get the details from Megan Mawicki. So here's what's ahead tonight on the CSR. More on McGriff, plus a complete wrap on the Cubs and White Sox. We'll have more on Bears training camp as the injury bug comes calling again. And we'll preview this Sunday's Kart IndyCar race at Chicago Motor Speedway as Michael Andretti talks about racing in the Windy City. Well, Eric, hopefully that was fast enough for the poll. At least they didn't crash. Let's go back to you and Bill. Eight-point lead, pressure on Miller, and Miller passed behind. And the Packers will take over on downs. And the miracle of the midway, which extended to two weeks, apparently has come to an end as the Packers take over on downs. Is it too early to call the week ahead a make-or-break week? You can never get too high. You can never get too low. You know, I know it seems like everybody seems to be devastated, but uh, you know, it's just part of it. Every Sunday is make-or-break time. You know, just like that game made a break the, the way the division may pan out um, at the end of the season. You know, we could have went up, you know, two and a half ball games on Green Bay and everybody else in the division. Yes, Brett Favre and company brought things into perspective, but with the next five games against Central Division opponents, there's no time to dwell on the loss, especially with Warren Sapp and the hard-hitting Bucks D on the horizon. Very critical. Uh, you know, it's tough when you go on the road anyway, and then you got Tampa and Minnesota coming up. So it's going to be uh, important that we go in to Tampa and get a win. Uh, uh, just every, if everybody go out and do their jobs, it, it shouldn't be a problem. Okay, we're halfway through editing our story, and the regular season hits the halfway point here at Hallis Hall. At 6-2, and two, the question now is, is the glass half full or half empty? If you told people we were going to be 6-2, and two, they wouldn't believe you. They thought it was going to be like we were last year. But, uh, you know, this is a different team. I think we're going to do the same thing in the second half, half as we did the first half. We're pleased to be where we are, let's say that. Disappointed with the loss yesterday, but pleased at the halfway point to be in a position we put ourselves in. So we have an opportunity now. We just need to take advantage of it. The Bears will be under the microscope this week to see how mature this team is. And a lot of the focus will be on head coach Dick Duran and his staff to see if they have what it takes to get this team refocused. Remember, even a 4-4 four and four finish should land the Bears in the playoffs. I'm Jeff Fisher for the Chicago Sports Report. And the end around to Marty Booker, and they're going to trap him for the loss. Third and one, and a trick play? Third and long, and a conservative call? Third down, and there is a pass to Des White out on the flat. Play calling is being called a problem by some. And, and maybe one of the reasons that they're not converting these third and ten pluses is because they're throwing the ball either a yard down the field or a yard behind the line of scrimmage. But offensive coordinator John Shoup is saying, no problem, and he's pointing the finger at himself. And head coach Dick Duran says he's standing by Shoup and his concepts. I'm definitely satisfied with how we approach the game, how we coach the game, how we game plan opponents, and how we've played. I was not obviously satisfied with our execution yesterday, you know, in any area. We just didn't execute really well enough to win. I think we did throw the ball downfield again. We just didn't come up with the plays that we needed to. I think if, if you look back and you go back and watch the film, we went down down the field four or five times. It just it didn't, you know, it didn't go our way. We didn't make the plays. Either I didn't make the throws, or we didn't come down with them, or they had a good defense called for it. We went downfield four times, threw the ball deep four times. We threw comeback about three times, I believe. Uh, we had a number of deep routes called, a number of them go to check downs, you know, it's just a uh, read progression by our quarterbacks. Uh, you know, the fact is we just need to create more big plays. Whatever the answer is to the offensive problems, they've got to find it pretty soon because the next five games are against Central Division opponents. You can never get too high, you can never get too low. You know, I know it seems like everybody seems to be devastated, but, uh, you know, it's just part of it. You know, you just got to work yourself through it. You know, we're still, today's another day. You know, and uh, Wednesday's still Wednesday. You got to come out ready to work and, and focus on Tampa Bay and going down there and, and be ready for a tough battle again. I'm Jeff Fisher for Chicago Sports Tonight.